a few issues <laughs> been dealing with the last few days at my house. So the furnace um, has been kind of on the fritz. So fortunately, we had space heaters last night, so we was able to keep our room warm and our daughter's room warm. But you know, it's been I put in a request on Wednesday, and there's nobody still answer. So I've been dealing with that. Uh, had my sermon, the PowerPoint saved correctly last night. Dude was doing the dogs this morning. Some said, you know, you need to check your PowerPoint again. Went back to my PowerPoint. My animations were gone. My transitions were gone and all the other stuff. So I had to work quickly with that this morning. Woke up with a sore back. So <laughs> it's, it's been an interesting 24, 48 hours. So I just ask that y'all um, be with me as I um, go through this sermon. Let's bow our heads. Father, which are in heaven again, we just come to you in prayer um, again, Lord. I ask that you will, again, be with me. I ask that you would, um, you know, put self aside, Lord, and that um, your words and your thoughts may be conveyed um, to your people, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So the subject today is... Um, Halloween, spiritualism, and Christians. With Halloween coming on Tuesday and with plenty of Halloween parties probably going on all this weekend, I thought it would be a good time to go over the subject of Halloween, its origins, um, and the satanic things associated with this holiday. And while there shouldn't be a need for this, but just because, there is, because of the times we are living in, we need to agitate the church about this day and, to, and let the church know that alternative Activities for this day are not acceptable to God in heaven. We as a church need to get back to understanding what's wrong with this day, get educated or re-educated on the subject of spiritualism and understand that God doesn't need a strange fire burning in his church to spread the gospel to the entire world. So let's start with finishing reading. We was in um, 1 Samuel. Um, we start at verse 7, and I'll read through um, verse 19. And it goes, says, And then Saul said unto his servants, Seek me a woman that has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his ser servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment, and he went, and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night, and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore, then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die. And Saul Swear to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there should be no punishment happen, happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up, Samuel. At this point, Samuel had died um, out of Israel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, What hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, be not afraid, for what thou, for what thou, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What from is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me. And God is departed from me and answered me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I call thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I should do. Then Samuel said, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee and is become thine empty? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. But thou, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing 
unto, unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also de deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shall thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. So when you read this passage of scripture, um, at this point in his, in his um, reign, King Saul had disobeyed God to the point where God had left him. So God was no longer answering him by prayer, by prophets, or any means. So in his desperation, Saul got desperate and went out and seeked a woman with, uh, with familiar spirits. Now, as we go through this um, sermon today, we'll show through scripture that anybody going after or going to seek the, the advice of a spirit, a woman with familiar spirit, usually get, um, get um, cast into death, well, stoned to death. So this is, so Saul, knowing better, being chose by God and, and chosen by Samuel, for him to go seek a, a familiar spirit was like a desperation um, act because of what the Philistines were bringing towards him. Now, we got to, I mean, so if you're a Saul, you got to understand if, if God is not answering you anymore and the prophets are not answering you anymore, then why are you, and you know what the penalty is for um, being with somebody with that kind of spirit, why would you go and talk to this woman anyway? So you can tell at this point that God had completely left Saul and he was very desperate. So one of the things you will notice about this scripture is that she, um, the witch does give an accurate display or accurate account of how him and his sons would die. And so I asked, I remember I was asking Pastor Haynes last week because it seemed like, well, did the Lord allow that to happen or did, had the Lord just stepped aside and Satan did this all his own? Corner, and I was talking and got some advice from Pastor Haynes. He said, you know, by this point, Saul had completely left the Lord. So it was by Satan's... Um, design that all this happened. So an unfortunate thing about that is because because he went to this woman and it was uh, Satan who had um, assumed the presence of, of Samuel that the woman gave a very accurate description of his death. So what happened was when the people of Israel saw that what she had said and then saw how he died, how that came to fruition and that came to pass, more people started in Israel started to believe the witch and gave her more, more emphasis or more credence to what she said because Satan was allowed to manipulate that situation for his own benefit. So we need to be careful as leaders how we conduct ourselves um, um, in our offices and stuff like that because we are leading the people. People are following us, and if we're, do, if we're not doing right, then people are not going to do right. So we need to be careful um, about this thing. Um, I'd like to read from you the uh, Acts of Apostles, page 290. She says, the magicians of heathen times have their counterparts in the spiritualistic mediums, the clairvoyants, and the fortune tellers of today. The mystic voices that spoke at Endor and at Ephesus are still, by their lying words, misleading the children of men. Could the veil be lifted from before our eyes, we should see evil angels employing all their arts and to, um, to deceive and to destroy Wherever the influence is exerted to cause men to forget God, there Satan is exercising his bewitching power. When men yield, when men yield to his influence, ere they are aware, the mind is bewildered and the soul polluted. The apostles' admonition to the, to the Ephesian church should be heeded by the people of God today. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And this is from Ephesians. That was Ephesians 5.11. And that's from Acts of Apostle, page 290. So the word that gets thrown around a lot, we start talking about witches, mediums, and familiar spirits, and words is the word like spiritualism. What is spiritualism and what people and practices are associated with this word? So as a definition, spiritualism is the following. Spiritualism, a system of beliefs or religious practices based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead, especially through mediums. So if you turn with your Bible, turn to Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 through 6. Ecclesiastes 9. We 
Ecclesiastes 9, 5 through 6. Give me a second here. Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 through 6. And it reads, For the living, I still see people turn, okay. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. And their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. Now let's go to Psalms 115. Psalms 115, we got verse 17. And it reads, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. So the Bible is very clear. So spiritualism is dealing with the practice of communication with the spirits of the dead, especially through mediums. But the Bible said the dead knoweth nothing. They don't know, they don't know anything so when you start seeing um, spirits of or ghosts or whatever you want to call them of your loved ones that have already died, uh, you need to understand those are not your loved ones. Those are demons or evil angels posing as your loved ones. So we need to be very careful how we, um, we see these things and understand. And, it's, and you know, it's, very pow- it's a very powerful image because you miss your loved ones. You wish they were, they were there with you. But so the devil or Satan uses that to his advantage and he have his demons impersonating your loved ones and get you to to buy into this stuff. So we need to be very strong as far as how we when we see these things and ask the Lord to to be with us and and drive these demons away. So we go to um, Deuteronomy. uh, Chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. And when thou art come into the land which the Lord have, the Lord thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations, of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through fire, or that use denovation, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drieth them out from before thee. So let's go on a little bit more te- um, detail about some of the things that were discussed in this verse. Divination, the practice of attempting to foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge by occult or supernatural means. Observer of times, someone who uses signs or omens to attempt to foretell the future. Today, we will call them a fortune teller, also astrology. So I want to take a moment right here and discuss astrology versus astronomy, because there seems to be um, a little, what's the word I want to use here? Unsure, uh, unsure about what the, the, the difference between the two. Um, a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I was at a church listening to a sermon. It was during the Christmas time, so it was more of a Christmas sermon. And the pastor was talking about um, Sami Magnus versus the Magi, the three wise men who went and saw King Jesus. Well, in the Greek, if you study the Greek, um, look at the Greek word for Simon Magnus and the Magi, they both use a word called magos. Magos is, is meant to describe people who does magic, um, uh, wizards, and stuff like that. So based on those two things, based on magos in those two areas of the Bible, he said wizards and sorcerers went and saw baby Jesus when he was born. So I'm sitting in the church, and I'm looking at this like, uh, you cannot be serious. 
you really think that the Lord God will have somebody who practiced black arts, you know, magic and all this other stuff to be, go and visit baby Jesus? I mean, and I know the, 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 the reason might be, well, God knows the heart and all this other stuff, but that's not the case in this, in, in this instance. So when we start looking at what's, you got to be aware. So when you start saying stuff like that, you need to dig a little deeper because obviously I wouldn't think the Lord God would have these type of people near um, baby Jesus when he's very defenseless. So when you start looking, so I'm going to describe, give you a definition of astronomy and then astrology. Astronomy is a science that studies everything outside of the Earth's atmosphere, such as planets, stars, asteroids, galaxies, and the, and the properties and relationships of those celestial bodies. Astrology, on the other hand, is the belief that the positioning of the stars and planets affect the way events occur on Earth. So we're talking about zodiac signs and stuff like that. What you will learn if you start to dig just a little bit deeper, and it didn't take much, if you just dig a little bit deeper, you start to understand that the word astronomy or the practice of astronomy didn't come about until the 17th century. Before that, if somebody said you study astrology or you're an astrologer, astronomy and astrology came underneath both, those, both that term. So when you start, so now when you start looking at the Magi, um, when they was out in the field and they saw that star pointing to, um, to baby Jesus, they was actually studying the stars. They were astronomers. They was looking at the star and seeing that a new star had came out. What does this mean? And, it was a, and the prophecy of Jesus has, had been disseminated to many cultures. So these guys, so Magos, which is a Greek, came from a Persian word, Magus, M-A-G-U-S. Under Magus, it was a cast of people who were astrologers and stuff like that, but it was people who studied astrology. It was people who were astronomers. It was people who were wise men. Once you start studying the Bible, you'll realize that a lot of things kind of came under, a lot of different things that people did came underneath one name. So back in Jesus' time, astrology or astrologers, people who studied astronomy came underneath the word astrology. Uh, so there was different people. There was sort of, you could be in, someone could say you're an astrology or astrologer and you don't study the black arts or magic or anything like that. You can just study the stars for positioning and stuff like that. So before Google Maps, you know, when people were um, in ships in the ocean, by night they studied the stars to know where they navigate. So if I study the stars, oh, based on the position of Orion's belt, I need to adjust my degrees by 30 degrees to the north to make sure I get where I need to go to. So we need to understand that, unfortunately, as we get later into the century, this is when the separate disciplines come out, but earlier on, they was all underneath one name. So, for example, if you look at Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, when they, came, when they got captured, you know, they went through the test and they found where they, they was cast in with the Chaldeans or the wise men or the wise men of that time. But underneath um, Babylon rule, you could be a wise man, but you could study, you could be a wizard, you could be a sorcerer, you could be a wise man, or you, you could be a different thing. As long as you had knowledge that other people didn't have, they cast you underneath that term. So when the astrologers, when the Chaldeans couldn't figure out the king's dream, he sentenced them all to death because they couldn't figure out, well, Daniel and his Hebrew boys were included in that group. So you got to be careful how you, I don't know if you're just trying to sound different or sound important, but you got to be careful how you start using Greek and start saying stuff like that. You got to logically think through things through, and if it doesn't sound right, you know, go investigate because if you just done some investigation, if they study the black arts, and you know, back in the Old Testament, they stone people and kill people for doing that, then why would that, why, why the, how does that fit? So you got to make sure scripture upon scripture, precept upon precept, make sure you pull everything together before you get up and speak on something like that. Um, enchanter, a person who uses magic or sorcery, especially to put someone or something under a spell. The thing that comes to mind today, hypnosis. We want to add a 21st century term to that. A witch, one that is credit, credited with usually malignant supernatural powers, especially a woman practicing usually black witchcraft, often with the aid of a devil or familiar sorceress. Charmer, a dealer in spells and orator who fascinates, one who softly and gently incantates, incants, one who whispers a spell. Consulter with familiar spirits, the spirit of a dead person evoked by a medium to advise or prophesy. 
A wizard, a person who practiced magic, a magician or a sorcerer. A lot of people say this is the male version of a witch. A necromancer, a person who practices necromancy, a wizard or magician. And then I look for, at the win, um, what the definition of necromancy is, is a supposed practice of magic involving communication with the deceased, either by summoning their spirit as an apparition or raising them bodily. For the purpose of divination, importing the means to foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge to bring someone back from the dead or use the deceased as a weapon, as the term may sometimes be used in a more general sense to refer to black magic or witchcraft. So when we looked at um, all the witches, enchanters, and all that, all of them, when we start researching for definition of these people, they all refer back to this. So when you look at the necromancer, which was the last one, you can almost say that he is like the apex of everything. So he can do it all. All the mother, a uh, wizard, a witch, a uh, chanter, whatever it is, a necromancer can do it all. So let's keep that in mind as we um, move forward. So we know what this is. We know what, what these people do. I'd like to go to the Bible and see what the Bible said about these people. Let's first go to Ephesians 5.11. Ephesians 5.11. So here's some pages turning. I'll wait a little bit. And it reads, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let's go to Leviticus 19.31. Leviticus 19, 31. And it reads, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20, next should be the next page over, verse 27. Leviticus 20, Verse 27, and it reads, A man also or woman that have a familiar spirit or that is a wizard shall surely be put to death. They shall, be, they shall, stone, them, they shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. First Chronicles 10.13 First Chronicles ten thirteen. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Next, I'm going to go to Isaiah five twenty. Isaiah 5.20. Still here some pages going. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And the last verse I want to go to is Acts 19. Thirteen through twenty. 
Acts 19, 13 through 20. And it reads, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of seven sons of one Scivia, Scivia, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirits answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Um, when I first read this, I was like, man, this is kind of thuggish right here, how they were speaking. <laughs> when you got an evil spirit speak to you like that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a clue to, just to turn around and walk away. And the man and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped, was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling in Ephesus, at Ephesus. And fear fell on them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. And many of them also which used curious arts and better translation for curious arts or magic, magic arts or occult practices. Uh, curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And he counted the, the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So, like I said, they said, you know, I know Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? I mean... I think the, 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 I think the millennials have a term, not about that life. You can tell these, these, these vagabond Jews were like a lower class of Jews, but they went around practicing false exorcism. Like they can exorcise people, and they really couldn't. So they saw Paul and his, and his, and his uh, followers doing it. So he said, well, if Paul can do it, we can do it. And that just, that's not the truth. <laughs> um, there's just two stories I want to tell. One story is, me and my wife, we went on a cruise back in 2007, and we visited Key West, the Bahamas, and another island, Coco Keys. So we was in Key West, we did a house tour. And we came to this one house, we went to this one house, and we went through it, and there was, the tour guy was telling us, well, you know, there's a room up here where this guy used to live, he built a room for his doll that he can keep there. I was like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting, whatever. Uh, we got back to the cruise, and then, because usually on a cruise, they just hit you with a, a number of people, and you had to start talking or whatever, and this is what you sit with during the week, during your whole cruise. So a, a group of people was with, they came back to, the, to, um, to dinner and said, oh, yeah, we took the Honda tour something tour through Key West. I was like, oh, really? And they started explaining this story, and they was like, well, there's a doll in the middle of Key West that they keep up in a glass container, and they won't get rid of it because they're scared of it. I'm like, okay, this kind of strange. What are you talking about? So they go through the story where back in the 1800s, a slave master raped his um, slave, and the slave had a baby. The slave master's wife uh, was jealous or upset about that, so she made the slave stay out in the cold for like 30 days straight until the baby died. So the slave <coughs> cut off all the baby's hair. Well, what they didn't know was that the slave practices voodoo. So what happened was when the slave master's wife, uh, when the slave master's wife got pregnant, she was um, the slave then was forced to take care of the baby once the baby was born. So what the slave did was she took the baby's hair, she made a doll, and then she took the, her baby's hair and sewed it into the doll. And then she put a spell on the doll saying that he would never leave this doll even in his adult years. He wouldn't leave it. He would always be attached to it and he wouldn't be able to get rid of it. And so... They talk about the story. The guy, the boy, he was attached to the doll. He grew up. He was attached to the doll. And eventually, you know, he had this house built, and this is the house we went to tour. And they had to, because it was a it was a big room with a, you know, the bed and all, I mean, the whole nine for the doll. I'm like, I, you know, now I'm starting piecing stuff together. I'm like, well, this is crazy. Um, so as an adult, he wouldn't leave the doll alone. He died. Um, and 
So once the person dies, well, okay, we can get rid of the dog. Well, they couldn't get rid of the dog. Every time they try to get rid of the dog, the uh, something will happen in Key West. Key West will have like calamities or something like that. So now the dog sits somewhere in a museum somewhere in Key West, still with the baby's hair from like 20 years ago, but it's all white now. And they are scared to get rid of it. They won't get rid of it. They let, leave it right there. They leave the house right there. They don't touch nothing. And they're like, so I'm just saying, thuggish behavior. <laughs> this stuff is real. <laughs> and we up, and when sometimes we as a church, we up here playing with this stuff and not realizing that this stuff, this, uh, he means business. And sometimes we just don't, uh, we don't, um, we don't, what's the word? We just don't, we don't respect. We shouldn't fear it, but we should have a healthy respect of it. Um, another story was, I was at State Farm uh, from years back working there, and I was with this guy who's a Mormon. So some of his guys were um, doing something, and they was, and one guy went to the kitchen to um, get some snacks or whatever, and they did something similar to Hail Mary, except they were supposed to bring the, Green Reap the Grim Reaper. So they was joking around, they did it, and then when the guy came out, and I guess the guy dropped, came out of the kitchen, he dropped the thing because he wasn't there. And they, so they turned around, and it's like, what happened? Why you dropped the thing? He's like, there was a mysterious figure here with a sickle and dressed in all black in a black coat. And it was like, and he said, they said he was white as a ghost. I mean, he was pale. It was like, he said, I said, what, you, what do y'all do? Oh, we just did something. I was like, well, y'all conjured them up. I was like, y'all need to start doing that mess. So again, we up here playing, uh, I think a few years back, Toys R Us, had the Ouija board. They were selling Ouija boards in the store for that. I'm like, we playing around with stuff, and we don't even know, understand what's going on. Right. And then we get caught up, because with the Ouija board, all the stories I have heard about that is you just can't throw that away. Somebody has to come in and pray over it, and then you have to burn it. If you just try to throw it away, the next day it will be back in your house. I heard, and I have heard multiple stories who said who have gotten Ouija boards that they cannot get rid of it unless somebody comes over and prays over it. And think about it. And it can't be just anybody praying over it. It has, it has to be somebody like the high priest. As he goes on the day of atonement, he has to go into the most holy place. He got to make sure there's no sin in him before he go, walks in or, or he has to confess, make sure he confesses his sins or else he will die once he steps into the most holy place. That's the kind of faith that somebody needs to have when you pray over this stuff to get rid of it. Because if you don't, stuff shows up the next day and you're looking out here like, what am I going to do? So we need to be careful about some of this stuff because we find ourselves in a situation that we won't be able to get ourselves out of. Amen. So when we're talking about Halloween and the origins of it, Halloween origins date back to the ancient Celtic festival of Samhain. The, Celtic, the Celts, who lived 2,000 years ago in the area that is now Ireland, the United Kingdom, and Northern France, celebrated their new year on November 1. So with Samhain, part of that festival was they built bonfires, they wore costumes, Self thought that the presence of the, early, the otherworldly spirits made it easier for the Jewish or Celtic priests to make predictions about the future. Um, they also burned crops and animals for um, their Celtic deity. So this is kind of like the, the beginnings of the origin of Halloween. This day marked the end of summer and the harvest and the beginning of the dark, cold winter. On the night of October 31st, they celebrated Samhain, but when it was believed that the ghosts of the dead returned to earth. By 43 AD, the Roman Empire had conquered the majority of Celtic territory. Two festivals of Roman origin were combined with the traditional Celtic celebration of Samhain. Ferella, a day in late October when the Romans traditionally commemorated the passing of the dead, and Pomona, the Roman goddess of fruit and trees, the symbol associated with her is the apple. So for the millennials, they might not know this, but for the Generation Xers and the Baby Boomers, we know what Apple is as far as dealing with Halloween. Bobbing for apples. So that's where it started from. On May 13, 609 AD, Pope Boniface IX dedicated the Pantheon in Rome in honor of all Christian martyrs and the Catholic feast of all martyrs, of all martyrs Day was established in the Western Church. Pope Gregory III later expanded the festival to include all saints as well as all martyrs and moved the observance from May 13th to November 1st. By the 9th century, the influence of Christianity had spread into Celtic lands where it gradually blended with and supplanted 
the older Celtic rites. In 1000 AD, the church will make November 2nd, All Souls Day, a day to honor the dead. It is widely believed today that the church was attempting to replace the Celtic festival of the dead with a related but church sanctioned holiday. Probably do a whole sermon on just that right there. Uh, All Souls Day was celebrated similarly to Samhain with big bonfires, parades, dressing up in costumes as saints, angels, and devils. The All Saints Day celebration also calls All Hallows or All Hallowmas from Middle East, All Hallowness, meaning of All Saints Day, and the, and the night before it, the traditional night of Samhain in the Celtic religion began to be called All Hallows Eve and eventually, eventually Halloween. So as we can see here, the tra- um, that's a to transition into Halloween and the origin and stuff like that, you know, we get down to and they transition over to America, uh, with the southern states while well, practicing it more fully to begin with, and the northern states didn't do it, didn't start Halloween originally because of the Puritans and all of them that lived up north, but eventually it worked its way up there and everybody started celebrating Halloween. So one of the things we want to talk about is because, you know, everybody feels like there needs to be an alternative to some of these holidays that we have out there. And a lot of times, you just, no, you don't. You just tell your kids the truth. They, a lot of times, when you tell the kids the truth, they, understand, they may not like some of it, but they'll understand it and they'll, just, and they'll move on. But when you try to indulge them and all that stuff, it's a lost cause. Yeah. So one of the favorite things that churches like to do is the trunk and treat thing. So what it is, you know, instead of them walking around, they come on the church property or whatever um, community centers, and you have cars with trunks full of candy, and they walk around, and kids just pick up um, candies out of the trunks. The original reason for that, it started back in the late, uh, early 90s with the uh, Latter-day Saints. And the main reason for that was safety. So as, you know, Halloween's on this coming Tuesday, when you listen to the radio or NPR, what they tell you, be careful when you go into the neighborhoods. You need to drive slowly because so you won't hit any kids or the kids won't get any accidents. And the reason they say that because when they put the mask on, because usually when you look straight, I can look straight, but I have my peripherals. So if something moves in my peripherals, I'm automatically turning to see what's going on, what's moving. That's our normal human reaction. But when you put the mask on, they no longer can see in their peripherals, the kids. So now you've got a safety issue, and then you've got it's dusk, it's dark. They're walking around in the neighborhoods, so it's very easy for them to get hit. So they'll t- you hear it on the radio, be careful about the kids. Make sure you're driving slowly, this, that, and the other. So to combat, to... to, to Minimized their, to that, they came up with, for a safety reason, let's do a trunk and treat where they won't be exposed to being in accidents. So, the true reason for trunk and treat is for a safety reason. It wasn't for a Christian alternative. So now you got all these churches who practice trunk and treat on their grounds. You, uh, you're essentially inviting Satan onto the church property to do, so you, you're, you are celebrating Halloween. You can, you can dress it up any way you want to dress it up. You celebrate Halloween. Trunk and treat is not a Christian alternative. It was just done for safety reasons. So when you come on, say, oh, they dress as angels, and you see kids dress as angels running around your neighborhood. So it's not, it's not that. You are truly worshiping, or you're truly celebrating Halloween when you have trunk and treat on Christian property or on your church property. So you need to be aware of that. Uh, I'd like to read another verse, 1 Corinthians 10. Chapter 10, verse 21. And this is, whenever, this is one of the first verses that I ran across when I started studying this. And this is going back to trunk and treat and having it on church grounds and stuff like that. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. Still hear pages turning, so I'll wait a little bit. All right. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partaker, partakers of the Lord's table and another, uh, another table of the devil. So it's very clear that you can't do both. Right. You got to either one or the other. You're either serving God or you're serving man. So when you're having a trunk and treat on your on church property, you're serving the devil. It's just that simple. So let's get into a little bit of money in Halloween. 2016, Americans spent $8.4 billion, with a B, 
billions dollars spent on Halloween, which include costumes, candies, and decoration. 2017 this year, it's projected that Americans will spend $9.1 billion on Halloween, which make it the country's second largest commercial holiday, probably second to Christmas. $9.1 billion. That is that's a lot of money. So this is a little chart I saw. And I'm sorry if you can't read it, but the first, the very top line, I guess the point is not working. But the very first line, 2017, it estimated this year, 179 or basically 180 million people will celebrate Halloween this year. Mind you, the um, United States population is 325 million. So you're talking about over 55% of people celebrating Halloween this year. Again, the record is 9.1, and then average spending per buyer. So the average person this year is going to spend like $86, $87 on Halloween per person this year. 2016, 171 million. So you can see it fluctuates between, 100, um, between 170 and 150 million people to celebrate Halloween. But this year, they're saying about 180 million. And I noticed this year, maybe just me, but I've seen a lot more decorations on houses and stuff this year than I have seen in years past. So I just, so it was, so this is kind of interesting to me. Spirit of Prophecy says, and this is going to another aspect of um, Halloween. She says, and this is like my favorite quote from her. It's something I struggle with, too, but my favorite quote. She says, the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands when if they had conquered on this point, they would have more power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian character. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptation to indulge appetite will be more powerful and more difficult to overcome. So, unhealthy facts about Halloween. American purchase nearly 600 pounds of candy on Halloween each year, equivalent to the weight of six Titanic ships. Six Titanic ships. That's 600 pounds of candy. Kids consume up to 7,000 calories on Halloween. That's the same as 13 Big Macs. That's, yeah, almost, that, 13 Big Macs, man, that's, <laughs> I don't, I can't even fathom eating 13 Big Macs, I'm sorry, <laughs> even when I was eating meat, I couldn't imagine eating 13 Big Macs. The average trick-or-treater consumes about three cups of sugar on Halloween, that's equal to about 220 sugar packets, Now I forgot to bring it, because, you know, you get the measuring cups, and I wanted to bring what a cup actually looked like. And for you to drink, to eat three cups of that, man, that is, I mean, I don't even know how you conceive of that. Ninety million pounds of chocolate, pounds of chocolate Americans will buy during the week of Halloween. Now, number of minutes, so it'll take you 130 minutes of walking, it would take to burn off a tall Starbucks pumpkin spice latte, and this is for the adults, because... You know, adults are those in Halloween, too. <laughs> 17, that's the minutes of burpees required to burn off the calories in a bite-sized Snickers, which is 160 calories. 17. <laughs> if y'all know what burpees are, that is a lot of burpees to do in <laughs> 17 minutes. Burpee is, I can't do it in my suit, but essentially you stand up and you jump to the, you kind of fall to the ground, but your legs jump out into a plank position. And then you jump back up and come back up. They say doing that for 17 minutes to burn off that snicker. You just ate. <laughs> As we get ready to wrap up, this is from the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, it is finally supposed that heathen superstitions have disappeared before the civilization of the 20th century. But the word of God and the, and the stern testimony of facts declare that sorcery is practiced in this age as rarely as in the days of the old-time magicians. The ancient system of magic is in reality the same as what it is, what it is now known as modern spiritualism. Satan is finding access to thousands of minds by presenting himself under the guise of departed friends. The scripture declares that the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9.5 their thoughts, their love, their hatred have perished, 
The dead do not hold communion with the living, but true to his early cunning, Satan employs this device in order to gain control of the minds. So think about it. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, what is it? Eat, eat of this fruit, you surely shall not die. You have, you'll be immortal. So we need to understand um, what is going on, understand that all the candy is not unhealthy. And, you know, you have issues with, um, I read the other day, that somewhere in New Jersey, they're worrying that some of the candies um, that kids would get on Halloween might be um, mixed with weed. So people might try to put weed into their candy um, this coming, because, you know, weed is everywhere now. So we need to be careful about how um, this is done, because I remember back when I was, you know, before I wasn't doing what I was supposed to have been doing, we went trick-or-treating one year. And the year we went out, trick-or-treating was the year that Halloween 2 came out. And those who haven't seen it, there's a situation in there with the apple and some things. So when we did that, we went trick-or-treating and we came home. You know, it was, we actually we threw out all the hard candy because we couldn't check it because we couldn't cut it. So we threw out the annihilators, the blow pops, and all that stuff. Because we had just seen this movie and everybody's been talking about it. And then we, ended up, we was on the kitchen table for like an hour just cutting up everything else to make sure there wasn't nothing within these candies so, um, you know, we wouldn't get hurt or anything like that. And suffice to say, that was the only year we went out because... That was just too much work, just sit there and cut candy for an hour. And you couldn't even eat it. <laughs> so we need to be, we need to understand that, and you need to teach our kids. I know when Mariah was in elementary school, uh, they had, you know, the Halloween parties, the Halloween dress up and all that stuff. And we told her, I was like, well, we told the teacher, like, well, our daughter don't celebrate Halloween. And she's like, well, you sure? I said, like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, because the thing was, well, if you don't, she doesn't celebrate, she doesn't come dressed up, then we got to put her in the library, and it'll be like four of the kids in there with her. Oh, okay. Uh, she knows. We, we talked to her. So I think the day it happened, uh, right when it was supposed to start, I went up. I was like, I'm going to go up here and get her. I don't want her sitting in the library where everybody running around having fun and all this other stuff. So I come up to the school. Man, that school was decked out in Halloween stuff like you walk into Santa's workshop. I mean, they had stuff everywhere. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, oh, my God. And the teachers running around in costume. Kids running around in costume. They were just, things were just chaos. It's the best way I can put it. So I got my ride and I came home. And then next year, same thing. By the time she got into the third grade, over half the school was sitting in the library. They could no longer celebrate, do the Halloweens like they wanted to. They could no longer do the costumes, whatever, because they didn't have enough kids supporting the activities. So they changed everything to like a fall party, whatever you want to call it. So stick, stay to your, uh, uh, stick to your guns. Uh, kids ain't going to like it sometimes. Your children ain't going to like it sometimes. But if you stick to your guns, eventually everything will work out. So hopefully this has been educational. You know, health-wise, you know, stay away from the candy as much as possible. As an adult, that's the first for the adults, too, because I sometimes find out that the adults are more happy about Halloween than the kids are. <laughs> because they want to get the candy and stuff. But we need to understand some of the stuff that's out here is dangerous. Um, you know, there's, there's certain things that you can use the Bible to conjure up spirits. The Bible doesn't teach that. So what you're conjuring up is, is devils and demons if you do it a certain way. Don't practice that stuff. But like I said, like that scripture said, you know, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I definitely don't know you. So you, you got a problem. So... Be careful about how we engage in stuff and make sure that as much as possible, and that includes horror movies and stuff like that. You know, you know I haven't watched a horror movie in 25 years. And people are like, you know, people, they'll, they'll make funny. Oh, you're scared, you're a sissy. I was like, whatever. Whatever. Like, oh, listen, I get a good night's sleep. You, 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 wonder who's, you hear a sound and you wonder what's, who's in your house for the next week because you watch this movie. So, I mean, that's, I mean, and that stuff don't bother me. Yeah, you can call me whatever, you can call me every name in the book. It doesn't even phase me. I'm sleeping good at night. You're not. So just remember that. So, and sometimes you got to be careful about the movie because I did get duped into watching one that was a horror movie because I'm a sci-fi fan. So one was a horror movie. And so you got to, now you got to start to read this, the descriptions and stuff like that. And just, you got to be careful, man. It just, it's so many different ways that the devil can get in. And this, and this time of year, man, if you're not, if you're not paying attention, he'll slip something in your house. Or if you're not guarding your house, he'll slip something in your house and you're not even aware of it. And now you're dealing with stuff that requires, like, 
an exorbitant amount of faith. And if you don't have that exorbitant amount of faith, you're in trouble because you won't be able to get rid of it unless you bring somebody in who does. So, like again, I hope this was uh, educational and hope everybody gained a blessing from it. Thank you.